American attempts to initiate a snapback to continue U.N. sanctions on Iran were hindered on Friday when 13 of the 15 U.N. Security Council members states uh, objected. The 2015 Iran nuclear deal contains a snapback that allows uh, signatories to keep the soon to expire sanctions in place. Can the U.S. call for the snapback even though it withdrew? from the 2015 agreement. Why did these 13 countries object or abstain to the U.S. proposal? Also, has Iran been keeping its side of the bargain? Joining me to discuss these questions and more are Christopher Chambers, who teaches media studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Mr. Chambers, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a while. So. Um, while at the United Nations, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo proposed the snapback, a provision in that deal, which will keep sanctions imposed on Iran. Considering that the U.S. pulled out of the deal in 2018, uh, from a legal perspective, does the U.S. still have the right to propose such a, mo a motion to initiate the snapback? Well, it's, it's not clear. Um, the Secretary General um, has removed uh, himself from uh, this kind of deliberation, signaling that he doesn't think that it has any uh, effect. He's basically pushed it back on the Security Council. Um, clearly, uh, 13 members of the Security Council not only think that it is not a legal move, but it's not even warranted by the facts. And then you have um, the UK. Um, uh, France and Germany, uh, you know, our, our biggest allies, saying it has no, it will have no legal effect, and there is no factual basis for this. So it's going to be tough uh, for the United States to make this case that you can um, trigger a, a, an agreement that you've backed out of uh, merely because there is some uh, recourse in the Security Council, and that is the only thing that the United States can hang its hat on, uh, so to speak, that there is uh, you know, this, this process in the Security Council to re-review this uh, uh, agreement. Um, however, again, if you're not a party to the agreement, then it becomes very, very uh, hard legally to make your case. But the administration, of, uh, the Trump administration has shown uh, many times, both in foreign policy and in domestic policy, that it is willing to argue both sides or, um, you know, a rather chaotic side if it wants to make a point. So it's, it's, uh, things are in, 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 in a ferment now, and we, we really don't know what's going to happen. Hmm. Let me bring back my previous guest, Mr. Stanley Kober, who is the Defense and Foreign Affairs Analyst. Thank you for staying with us. Um, Mr. Kober, what is your understanding of the situation? Because to a lot of people, it is rather bizarre, right? The United States criticized the deal, it threw away the deal, or it withdrew itself out of it, and yet now it wants to, um, it wants to trigger a provision in that deal. Does the U.S. really have the legal right to do that? You know, I, I wish we had uh, more observance of international law, but uh, whether it has the legal right or not, we're doing, you know, the Trump administration is doing it. Um, but the, I think you need to look beyond that to the logic behind it. Mm -hmm. um, they are invoking a logic of sanctions. Uh, the president has said that if he is reelected, he expects Iran to make a deal because the economic pressure on Iran from all these sanctions will force it to yield. Um, this is the assumption behind a lot of what they are doing. They assume that we have this overwhelming economic uh, pressure and people have to yield to our economic pressure. And I keep thinking back to 1941. Um, you can tell I'm very historical. Mm -hmm. And we put enormous sanctions on Japan. Mm -hmm. The Japanese responded by attacking Pearl Harbor. They did not yield. They did it knowing we were militarily superior. They had been told that by their naval commander, Yamamoto. They did it anyway. Um, this is what concerns me. When I read the Iranian press, they're saying there will be revenge for Soleimani. When I look at what's going on with Hezbollah, um, and I am concerned that we may be misreading the Iranians. 
All right. Let me bring in a Iranian guest, Mr. Hamid Musavi, Professor of Political Science at the University of Tehran. Mr. Musavi, thank you very much for joining us. What is your take on what uh, Mr. Koba was saying that uh, possibly the U.S. is repeating its mistake with regard to sanctions on Japan in the, in the early 1940s? Um, is the U.S. misreading Iran at this moment? Uh, so the whole uh, concept of Trump saying that he's going to make a deal in four weeks with the Iranians after the election is basically nuts because if that logic would have worked, it should have worked in the past three and a half years. I mean, during the past three and a half years, Trump has sanctioned Iran enormously and that hasn't really brought the Iranians to the negotiating table. So how is that logic going to work after the elections? Nobody knows. Um, what I think the Trump objective is, at least for more extreme elements such as Mike Pompeo, is that they want to kill the nuclear deal before the elections. There is a very good chance that Joe Biden might get elected. And Biden has already said that if elected, he will return to the nuclear deal. And I think what the Trump administration wants is that they want to completely destroy the nuclear deal so that there's no deal to return to even if Biden is elected. Hmm. So what do you, um, both of you, I mean, Mr. Chambers and um, Mr. Musavi, make of the fact that even the U.S.'s closest allies are not behind the U.S. in this decision? It's seen in the Chinese press as a very big embarrassment and vindication of the kind of uh, isolation that the U.S. has imposed post on itself in it when it comes to multilateralism. Um, Mr. Chambers, how is that viewed by you and by observer, observers in the United States that, you know, this is, uh, the U.S.'s proposal is literally uh, rejected by the great, great majority of the U.N. Security Council members? Well, it's very, it's very troublesome for the United States. Um, you have a situation where uh, our biggest allies uh, just in the world uh, and, uh, and on the Security Council um, are basically saying that our position has not only no factual effect but no legal effect. What this does is ripple down to other nations um, uh, who we might pressure to uh, join us in, in some kind of, uh, you know, uh, small, you know, our own sanctions or to pressure in the Security Council or the UN to, uh, to trigger some of these things that we, we want. I mean, um, there's a situation now where either Niger or, or, in, or Indonesia could, uh, could come to our uh, aid by uh, putting out a, a, a draft, um, the Dominican Republic. I mean, it depends on who's circulating as president of the Security Council. And we can put individual pressure on those countries. I mean, we've done that before, but other countries are going to sit there and say, well, if they're going to pressure us, fine, but, you know, we have Britain, France, and Germany, and, and uh, a number of other larger nations that will be on our side that will trade with us, uh, no matter what the United States uh, promises to do or not do or threatens us behind closed doors yeah. uh, to do. So that's going to be, that's a real problem. Yeah, and I think it is quite inconceivable because uh, how multilateral, how international diplomacy works is that you pretty much have to know what you're going to get before you go out and announce that you're going to get this, right? When you have a resolution, you pretty much know beforehand how much support you have, how much support you don't have before you, 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 you make a, a public, let's say, embarrassment of yourself, Mr. Koba. And it seems here that the U.S. just went along not knowing what the outcome would be or maybe it didn't care at all how things fare in the United Nations, Mr. Koba. Uh, yes, the, it's very strange here in Washington now. There seems to be a resurgence of the feeling right after uh, the Berlin Wall came down, people talked about the unipolar moment, that we were the unchallenged uh, superpower. And we just think now we can tell people. Um, you know, there, there, there's a line uh, from the poem um, Sir Galahad. Um, his strength was as the strength of ten because his heart was pure. They are, you know, the people in the administration are absolutely sure of the purity of their intentions. And so they magnify their strength and are generally bewildered that other people don't go along with them. It, that's the way I see it.
Hmm. So, sometimes, so you're basically saying they do not know <laughs> that be, that they're actually surprised that people don't it, go. It, <laughs> it it really amazes me. Yeah. So when you know, I, I, I read the statements. It 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 just stuns me. Hmm. Mr. Musavi, how is uh, this this voting? How is the outcome seen in Iran? And uh, what is Iran's message to the to the outside world after this uh, d latest development? Well, the Iranians see the Americans as very isolated. I mean, it was only the Dominican Republic that voted with the Americans on the resolution to extend the um, sanctions on armaments. Um, and regarding snapback as well, 13 countries have said that they are against this. Uh, well, nevertheless, I think the battle is still not over. Uh, yes, yes. So two countries voted against and 11 countries abstained, whereas the Americans were hoping at least for the United Kingdom and for France to vote in favor. Um, nevertheless, I think the battle is still not over. Uh, the Americans are saying that they are going to pursue this in the following weeks. Also, there is a chance that in 26 or 27 days when the 30-day limit um, is over that the Americans might come out and say that the sanctions have returned regardless of what, their, what other countries think. So I think this is going to be an ongoing battle until the elections in November. It's still not over. Hmm. Um, what is Iran doing in terms of observing your uh, obligations, your side of the agreement? Uh, so, 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 according to the nuclear agreement, the only body that is authorized to measure this is the IAEA. According to the IAEA, until the Americans left the agreement in May 2018, Iran was fully complying by its side of the deal. When the Americans left, Iran still complied for another year, but in the second year, they slowly started to uh, decrease um, their responsibilities under the gr agreement. Nevertheless, Iran is still party to the agreement, and okay. it's abiding by the most important segments of it, yes. All right. We have to leave it there. Interesting discussion. Many thanks to my guests, uh, Mr. Musavi joining us from Iran, Mr. Koba and Mr. Chambers joining us from the United States. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lushin. Follow me on Twitter with uh, Lushin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point. I hope.